The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone, welcome to the Stoa. Um, Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa. The Stoa is a place for us to cohere in dialogue but what matters most at the nice edge of this very moment. And today we have Sarah Perry is back at the STOA. So excited. I, I reached out to her, asked her what, what she'd like to do on the STOA. And she, she said, I have a bunch of cool ideas. And one of them was on scenes. So that's what we're going to talk about today, how scenes kind of are formed and what they are. Um, so I'll tag in Sarah in a moment. She's going to share her screen and then we'll have a little presentation. Then we'll have a Q and A. So if you have any questions, go in the chat. And uh, if you want to be on YouTube, uh, just indicate that and I will uh, read it on your behalf. So that being said, Sarah, welcome back to the STOA. Can you, you can't unmute yourself. Okay, you can unmute yourself now. There, thank you. <clears throat> um, yeah, my, uh, my topic is hobbies and scenes. Um, uh, I kind of one of my hobbies basically is abstract nouns like I'm obsessed with abstract nouns and I get really excited about some particular abstract noun and right now it's hobbies um something I've been interested in for a while just uh and I want to go through kind of why I think it's interesting and and overlooked and um why uh how hobbies and scenes interact what what the structure is um and then go through some kind of cool developments in, in hobbies and scenes that I see recently. So let me see if I can find my content. Sorry, I don't, I don't use this platform much, so just had it up. Can we see that now? Nope. No, I don't see it. Um, okay, let me. Did, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it by the screen. Okay, yeah. Do you have share screen? Sorry. Access? Yeah. Okay. Let me just. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, All right. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. Yes. Yes. All right, let's, uh, there we go. All right, can everybody see something that says hobbies and scenes? Yep. yep. Okay, all right, so checking on, checking on a few different sources. Some of these are, are independent scholars like me, some are academic, but so why are, why are hobbies interesting? Um, this is a hobby is one word for it. Um, some of the other concepts just so I'm, I'm not, I'm not focusing, hyper-focusing on the word, it's just pointing at this, this group of behaviors, things that are called amateur, hobbyist, often informal. Um, there's this, this kind of category of behavior of the stuff people do kind of by choice, like when they're free, um, sometimes when they're alone, sometimes with other people, but not, not being kind of uh, obligated to do stuff by work or school or something. So what, what do people do when they're free? That's a really interesting question. And I think it's interesting that it kind of comes to us with this language of, of it being less legitimate than the professional and the official and maybe academic. Um, so starting out, you know, just stuff people are doing is already kind of, kind of used a, uh, in a deprecatory sense. Um, the thing that got me excited about hobbies is Seth Roberts awesome paper. I'll, I'll show some excerpts from this in a little bit, but um, his idea was that hobbies are this really important thing. He has kind of a theory of everything that I find really fun um, about human evolution and the, the role of hobbies and procrastination. Uh, the basics of it is that rather than work being kind of the fundamental thing, he thinks that hobbies are, are this sort of clue or key to, to what we are and, and uh, how, how we developed and um, that they're kind of cues to, to what human beings are and how we became technological. So they're they're fundamental to being human. They're they're cross cultural. They're everybody's doing it, um, and he in his model they they come first before jobs. So his model, people do specialized foraging. They focus on maybe one protein source or one uh, particular source, and 
people within a group specialize in different ones, maybe, or people within an area specialize in different protein sources. He thinks after that comes hobbies, basically, that specialized behaviors um, come very early, that people wanting to make things and uh, not necessarily for a market, that there, there wouldn't even, maybe in order for there to be a market, for there to be money like objects, this, this has to come first. Um, he connects this to the human tendency to give gifts. I'll talk a little about that, to procrastination. Uh, and his story is really that humans, humans specialize. I'll contrast that with the with the Rene Girard story of, of mimesis, because I think they're they're kind of in, in opposition to each other. Um, an interesting source, a book called Hedonizing Technologies. Uh, I found found pretty interesting that uh, there's a thesis kind of that um, it's interesting that the things that people do as hobbies look a lot like obsolete work. So it's kind of just noticing that and being like, what's what's going on with that? Um, people are doing something that people might've done, you know, hundreds of years ago that are technologically obsolete, like a lot of needlework, the stuff I do um, that wouldn't be efficient for production, but people like to do it anyway. So it's kind of the, that's an interesting thing about people. Um, I'll go into a little bit about someone called Alan McFarlane. Uh, uh, his theory takes it a little in a different direction that, and it's more about scenes than about hobbies, although the two are connected in his work, uh, that have to do with the, the social importance of, of these scenes, these sort of informal amateur hobbyist situations, um, somewhere little organizations that are between the level of the family, that are a little bigger than a family, but smaller than the church and the state, and they're, they're kind of not associated with the church or the state. So these, these special little organizations, we'll see more about that. Um, and I think they're just kind of inherently interesting because that's that's what that's how they come to be. People are interested in stuff, and so a scene will kind of accrete around that stuff, whatever's interesting, um, and especially interesting in novels. So fashion is changing it all the time. Um, here's here's a little bit. I think the the core of the interesting part of the the Seth Roberts paper. I really recommend reading the paper. Um, I don't know if it was ever actually published. It's a book chapter. I don't know that the book was ever published, but it's. It's on the internet, search the, search the title string to find it. Um, so he's talking here about the connection between procrastination and, and hobbies. So here's, here's the story. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll go through some of, the, some of this wall of text, sorry about that. Um, I propose the mechanism that causes the two necessary features. So he's going through intense repetition and diversity of repetition now cause procrastination. Um, procrastination is a modern side effect of a mechanism that was at the center of human evolution. Uh, he means not starting an important task, such as doing your taxes or writing a term paper. So procrastination seems like something that you're not doing, like avoiding behavior. But his take on it is that it's actually keeping you doing the same thing. So, so independently specializing in something, not doing everything else. That procrastination is a form of keeping you doing the same thing. Um, he has, I, li I like the story, I just want to want to read a little from this. I think the mechanism works something like this. All tasks have a mental hedonic tag, I like that simplicity, anywhere from painful to blissful. When we consider doing a task, we retrieve its tag. The more positive the tag, the more likely we will choose to do the task. So maybe you've heard the term of an UG field. There's a task with, the, it's really unpleasant. It has an UG field just sort of emanating from it. This is kind of the opposite of that. Like everything either has an UG field or a, or a yay field maybe. And, most tasks, especially unfamiliar ones, have a slightly negative tag, which makes them harder to do. So he thinks procrastination is the fact that most things, especially unfamiliar things, have this sort of negative tag, um, not having a theory about where that comes from. But um, when we actually do one of these tasks, however, the fact of doing it makes the hedonic tag more positive. So when we get used to something, it becomes more pleasant, and we want to kind of keep doing the same thing over and over to some extent. Um, and then uh, the, the thing I have that this is what I've, what I've written here as a note is it's, this is a feeling of being in a specialization tunnel, the feeling that you started out doing this craft. Um, it's, it's pleasant to do it. It's pretty easy to do it. You do it a lot. So you're getting better at it. You're kind of pushing the possibilities for it to keep it interesting. So it doesn't get kind of too repetitive, but you're not just going to start doing something else. Um, he says, it's illustrated by a novelist who found she had to write seven days a week. If she stopped on weekends, getting back to work on Monday was too hard. He says, a true story, but I cannot find the reference. I think that is valid. <laughs> so um, so this, this sentence I have highlighted here, diversity of specialization requires diversity of avoidance. 
meaning that if if you want to have people all doing this all doing different things kind of specializing in different things um if you don't want to just be competing and everybody making the exact same thing um people have to get interested in different things so this is this is the core of his model uh if you want to have experts at tasks a b and c the persons who do a must avoid b and c so he thinks uh procrastination is the is kind of a nice abstract noun for this mechanism of doing one thing and not doing everything else. So uh, this is his, his mechanism of specialization. Um, here's a, a little little different piece of this puzzle from the paper. Um, taking, taking a clue from economics, he says, he's a little bit of a dunk here, that's, that's a little overstated, but ec economists have not yet noticed that gifts promote or at least promoted innovation, but they have noticed that gifts differ from other goods. His theory is that the gift giving tradition supports um, uh, supports a lot of blessed economic advantages. And I'll talk a little about that, but um, there's this, this concept of deadweight loss of gifts, meaning the difference between the, what the giver paid and what the recipient would have paid. Uh, and some, some probably sketchy measures of this, uh, deadweight loss of gifts was claimed to be about a third of the price. So if you pay $60 for a gift, the recipient would have paid 40. Uh, Seth Roberts says, calling this, a difference, calling this difference a loss fails to make it clear that it was a subsidy to the maker of the gift, especially to those responsible for the details that made it more of a gift and made it special, such as um, makers of wrapping paper. So the idea here is that this inefficient thing, this, this economically inefficient practice uh, is really widely beneficial, that it's kind of very lucky and nice that we have this seemingly irrational preferences, <laughs> that we get this kind of subsidy or development fund for random frivolous things, and often that pays off in, in non-frivolous ways. Uh, and I think people doing frivolous hobbies and giving each other frivolous gifts, uh, he sees that as, as something that, uh, that drives innovation. Um, one way he expresses this is decoration and art require control of materials. He has a, I, I won't go through this whole wall of text, but uh, he's noting often stuff that's really frivolous that's just about the appearance of things like dyes uh, will end up being something that opens up an area of science that's much more practical. Um, it says an innovation in decoration, like a new color reflecting a new way to control materials would fetch a high price at first. As the novelty wore off, the price that it could fetch went down. Without fashion, decorators and, decorators and artists would do the same thing over and over. Uh, improvement with practice would make repetition much easier than innovation. So um, the, the sort of frivolousness of fashion and people wanting novelty is also also driving innovation, even if it's not it's not direct. Um, it gives examples from metallurgy, um, of course, uh, the discovery of, uh, of artificial dyes kind of driving chemistry. Um, I have a little note on the left that there's, I think uranium is an example of this, that it was first used as a glaze in pottery and as a, as a kind of pretty dye stuff. Uh, so people kind of knew how to how to get it and how to mine it to some degree. Uh, a long time ago, like hundreds of years ago, uh, before we really knew what else it could do. So it, it had been kind of identified as something interesting for aesthetic reasons, for making stuff special, making stuff pretty and novel. Um, and that was just sort of just randomly hit upon that. So um, there's there's a lot of, of examples of this. Um, Because you're because in order to decorate, you have to have some kind of control of the materials. Often those have have kind of interesting uh, side effects, and those side effects can't be predicted. But it's the sort of uh, Seth Roberts calls it sort of gap bridging, like going from breaking out of local maxima, just kind of doing exploration, finding neat things by um, by the sort of human drive for novelty, for special things, even if they're not. Uh, uh, practical. So this is, uh, in, in uh, Rene Girard's theory, uh, people kind of have to copy each other, or people, people inherently copy each other's desires and behaviors. And there's this whole thing where they, um, they uh, copy each other so much that they all want the same thing. And then there has to be a scapegoat who gets murdered to solve everything. Um, this seems like the counter to that, that Robert's model is about people anti-copying each other. Uh, they're trying to do each do different repetitive behaviors. Like there's, there's sort of, I think it's the teller from Penn and Teller said something about magic, sort of the secret of magic is always just a ton of preparation. That's more, more preparation than you would imagine was possible. And I think that's, that's kind of true for making things, making interesting things in general. Um, 
that if everybody's kind of working on the same thing, you don't get the same benefits from uh, from discoveries if everybody's kind of doing a different thing and you don't have as much incentive for specialization. So in this model, you have people kind of, I have this, the, um, the uh, what's it? Junji Ito graphic over here that you're kind of entering um, more and more specialization that what it, what, what the human trajectory looks like is not just sort of being a person in general, um, you know, having maybe even general intelligence, but it's, it's becoming more and more specialized to particular uh, areas and tasks uh, and, and things and people. Um, there's, there's kind of less, less copying than more intentionally avoiding copying each other, trying to uh, do things differently so that your, you know, your personal um, specialization whole is different from everybody else's. Um, just a note on this, I think the, the connoisseurs or you know, fans uh, are important scene participants, not just the people producing things, but the people whose tastes uh, are diverse and specialized enough to support all kinds of different activity. Um, often connoisseurs are, are important in driving even hobby stuff, even stuff that's not, um, not market-based. People who take things seriously can appreciate small differences in things uh, and uh, drive kind of uh, investment in, in making new and interesting things and high quality things. So another another perspective on this is that I think I think there, it's easy to imagine that we just know what other people do, but I don't think we do. <laughs> I think there's this huge void that we should focus on of ignorance about what people do. Um, it's easy to sort of have a mental picture of it. Maybe it's maybe it has the earth with little little scaled people walking around on it, but. Uh, nobody knows. Um, I have this, this void on the right of unobservable experience and behaviors of about 7.7 .7 billion humans, not to mention the humans of the past. We don't know and we can't know. And I have these little, these are flashlights. I have these little flashlights drawn on here. These are the, the windows we have kind of, or the ways we have of looking into the void and getting something out of it. Uh, one thing we have is our own experience and that's, you know, modular your memory, your records, your artifacts, so you don't you don't necessarily have your whole experience as a movie to play out. You have you have something left from your experience to know about how people spend their time. Um, you can observe near others, especially people you live with, see you know what at least what they do. To some extent, you get some information about how they feel about it. And then the third big window, probably the most important one for for this, is the output of scenes. That um, if there's a scene in which people are are kind of displaying what they have done in private, how they have specialized or uh, displaying themselves in some way, um, then we can get some information about what people do. And that's, it's not like you can just um, take everything as true, but you can, it's, it's at least a window into what's going on. Um, I think most private and hobby activity is not visible. It's just dark matter, we will never know. Um, even if we could surveil every person we wouldn't know, but I think it would, it, it changes behavior to be surveilled. What I'm interested is, is in, in most is unsurveilled behavior. Um, scenes allow for the display of the fruits of offstage specialization, meaning what you're doing offstage, uh, the sort of practice and um, specialization is, is presented um, on a scene as, as some form of excellence. And that, that looks a lot different. I'll talk about different examples of that, but that looks a lot different in different hobbies uh, and on different scenes. I think one temptation is to think that we know what people do because we have surveys, but I think that's that's not that's not a very good way of understanding how people spend their time. One issue is that it it kind of gives us a false picture of homogeneity because surveys kind of will categorize like oh well this many people do uh, running and this many many people do needlework and you know maybe have you done this in the last six months? It doesn't give us much information about what people are actually doing. You know what it means to them, how much time they're spending. Uh, we could have some information about that, but I think watching a scene gives you a lot richer and and better information than than surveys. And uh, yeah, I just think I don't think I don't think that most most techniques of dealing with hobbies, to the extent the hobbies are even dealt with academically, are are very useful. Another thing about hobbies, um, I don't think you can choose what you like. Uh, people try out a lot of potential hobbies, but only if you kind of grab them, the sense of having a vocation. It's not necessarily your work, but something that you can't help liking. 
Um, I've heard there's a speedrunner, Carl Jobst, who says, I don't, you know, people feel like speedrunning is a silly hobby, but you can't really choose what you're into and what you like. Some things uh, fit with people and grab you without any deliberate choosing. And it, it's not like you can just assign somebody a hobby. That's something like I personally have tried, you know, hundreds of things and I only have these few things that I do over and over and I couldn't just switch to a different thing. So um, I think it's, there's a lot of, of calling out from the world and not just imposing ourselves on them. Um, this is two, two kind of perspectives that are, that I mean to have kind of set up the other side of things. Um, what the first one is just a brief quote. So this is, this is a Gordon essay. Who's awesome. Um, the essay is called the culture is not about aesthetics and it's, it's a semi-serious argument. It's an interesting argument on why we should have a moratorium on writing fiction for a while. <laughs> there's enough books, there's enough fiction. Most of most fiction that gets written is bad. Um, people are generally will do better if they read better books. So we should just have people stop writing because it's we don't need any more any more fiction books basically. And, um, I love I love the essay. I think it's really interesting. Um, there's the uh, another side of this presented in Hedonizing Technologies. She talks about technologies making the transition from drudgery to delight as they lose their practical relevance to production. And from both of these, I think you can see a sort of a background assumption that people's behavior should be like efficient or, <laughs> and, and uh, that they should be, uh, that, that producing things should be extremely connected to the demand for a product. Um, and that it's, it's somehow strange or, uh, or needing to be explained if it's not that way. Um, have a, my own wall of text here. So I guess there's there's kind of a question that is is common sense from some perspective and makes no sense from another, which is like why do people enjoy doing what appears to be work for no practical reason? You know why are you making your 14th shawl uh, when you definitely don't need any more shawls? Um, I think there's there's not a paradox here unless we make unwarranted assumptions about human motivation. That there's there's sort of it's easy for some of us who've, who've been to too much school to start thinking that. We're mainly driven by these analytic market efficiency concerns. We're, we're doing behavioral choices based on, uh, you know, what we can produce. And that's, that's kind of privileging abstractions over just people's behavior. Um, it would be kind of crazy if we hated work, even though, even though I think it's very normal to hate work now because it's, it's, uh, it tends to be surveilled and highly constrained time. Um, it would be really weird for an animal to hate everything that it needs to do. Like, I think you can just watch a cat and it likes hunting. Like I, I, it can't talk, it can't tell you, but it, it seems pretty clear. If it just hated catching things, it probably wouldn't do very well. So noticing that people like things that look like work is it shouldn't be that surprising. Um, and human enjoyment of doing and making for its own sake doesn't require an explanation. Um, People, people do stuff. There's no option to just do nothing. Um, go, sorry. Okay. Um, so if we if we were perfectly efficient and we didn't write any unnecessary fiction and we didn't produce special things with useless decoration, uh, I don't think we'd be human. I don't think our tech tree would be as cool. Um, we would sort of be uh, efficiencying the the cool stuff away. Um, fashion drives innovation because it's inefficient. Um, and leaps in technology are kind of stumbled upon because people are capable of deep immersion and capable of getting bored, that we are capable of really getting into something and uh, needing more novelty, needing more, uh, more interesting stuff to happen. Um, doing nothing doesn't really exist. Experience is not optional. Um, it's not the default background condition against which any, any behavior must be explained. We shouldn't have to explain why people just don't you know, sit there inert. Like it's, it's pretty difficult to sit there and that, that would be a strange thing to have happen. Um, and people's, people's free behavior seems to be driven by desire, which is not necessarily um, subject to being made efficient. <laughs> okay, so here's another, here's another take on things that I think is really good and exciting. Um, Alan McFarlane's book, The Making of the Modern World. Um, and here he's talking about, I, just, I, look, I like the expression, the game is the thing. Here he's talking about uh, the importance of these mid-sized clubs, um, small organizations that are pretty informal, um, smaller than a state, bigger than a family. Um, 
I'm going to read a little bit of this. Uh, Firstly, these games need the organization within which they could occur, the bounded areas of space, time, and attention that permits a group of people taking time away from the calls of economy, kinship, state, and religion to kick a ball about or whatever the activity is. I like that definition of a scene. I think that's pretty much what's, what's happening in a good scene. Um, this is provided by the club with its rules, pitch, clubhouse, and so on. And I think rules are great. Rules are really interesting and important. <laughs> There's something that's constantly negotiated and they allow for uh, the possibility of, of excellence. Uh, and then that extraordinary blend of competition and cooperation, self-love and social obligation, which is the quintessence of team games is encouraged. It is a template for all other kinds of collaborative behavior. The goal is to win in sport, war, wealth production, or pursuit of merit. The rules are known and involve mutual responsibilities as well as personal gratification. The boundaries of the activities are strictly policed. That's an important one I'll talk about, that uh, things like what counts as this, you know, it's, it, there's the expression, it's not cricket, meaning it's, a, it's outside the boundaries of, of what we're calling fair play. That we're, and those can change depending on people's preferences. Uh, in theory, during the game itself, the demands of kinship, faith, social status, political power should be excluded if possible. The game is the thing. The same spirit of those who pool their talents and assets to form a trading company, bank, operatic society, or a legion of quangos, quasi-autonomous non-government organizations, or what, what is often referred to as civil society. So um, uh, he, he likens them to middle-sized plants filling in densely the space between the high vegetation and the treetops of the state and church and the single individuals or family on the forest floor. Uh, in most civilizations, this middle level has been increasingly cut away leaving a huge space between the state and the established religion on the one hand and the clinging bed of short, flat and lateral links that is the extended family. Uh, but once the peculiar associations start to flourish as Tokyo noticed in America, or Fukuzawa tried to encourage in Japan, they crowd into this middle area, weakening the despotic power of the two extremes, the roof canopy of state of God and the amoral familistic demands of the kinship group. Okay, so um, so these are, he, he thinks that these are load bearing as I as, uh, was in the title of this, that they are kind of what civil society is built on and they're and far from being frivolous, they're absolutely critical. Um, here's, a, here's a slightly different expression of this from the same book. Um, he thinks that parties, clubs, associations, these are the organizational secret of modernity. Only they could effectively overcome the two extremes of anomie and contract or holism and status. They made tolerable the separation between different parts of a society and indeed help to maintain it. Um, they constitute the increasing division of the world into small meaningful social spaces which cross the boundaries of primordial loyalties. So this is kind of like his explanation for what makes humans so cool that they can do these, have these sort of scenes and hobbies and uh, put cool rockets into space and, and uh, stuff like that. Um, let's see. So here's, here's my last slide and then I'll, I'll, uh, we can have more of a discussion. Um, just want to talk about some of the, the current scenes and hobbies that I find interesting. I'm really interested in speed running. So video game, doing video games as fast as you can. Um, one, one thing I think all, all sports have in common is the possibility of cheating. So cheating is a, I see it as sort of a definition or negative definition of the space within which excellence can occur. So it's almost, here's, here's what counts as the game. And in speedrunning, it's interesting because things that would look like cheating uh, in, in uh, some categories are perfectly acceptable in others. So they each, each little extreme diverse, extremely diverse group gets to kind of define its own rules. Um, uh, people like to, people don't all run the same game. Some games are more popular than others. People run different categories of games. Uh, there's a very legible uh, measure of what counts as being good. So it's very attractive in that way. I think that's good. Um, but on the other hand, there's, there's extreme diversity of, of who chooses to run, to run what game and how they do it. And often involves the, the level of interaction with the game itself is often really high, just breaking down the game with, to, to, um, in a way that, that it wasn't originally designed to be played, but, um, kind of examining it in, in the ultimate detail. I think, I think they're great. Um, They've had, they've had some cheating scandals recently. They, they came out looking great with that. Not that it's all one group, obviously. We're talking about a very diverse group of people, but uh, the fact that they're doing things like running Monte Carlo simulations and 
uh, publishing papers to explain why somebody cheated. It just seems like there's so much uh, energy and caring and, and I think excellence in the field. So um, even if you could say, you know, they're learning these skills that could translate over into other things, that's fine, but I don't think that's the point. I think the point of speedrunning is speedrunning. Um, the scene is there, there's, there's multiple scenes, um, but it's uh, definitely a hobby that I find interesting. I don't do it myself, but I'm, I'm a fan, I guess. Um, a lot of scenes are based around a particular person on Twitch or Discord. They're very common, a particular YouTuber who often has their own Discord or, or is also a Twitch streamer. Um, these are kind of interesting scenes to me because they're kind of centered around a, a person. One aspect I find interesting is emotes, which are kind of this uh, little uh, emojis are often referred to as gestures in linguistics. They, they seem to look more like a gesture than a word. But these are little uh, little graphics that you can use that people use as gestures. They're often, you know, handcrafted in the sense that an individual may have, uh, you know, contracted to make them or made them themselves. Um, and they make they kind of make things special without altering the function. They're they're along the lines of um, decorative, so kind of decorative novelty, making a new gesture. I think there's a similar function for skins in video games that it's not altering the function, it's just making it special. So that's similar to, I don't know, the role of, of dyes and cosmetics and stuff like that. Um, one thing I find really interesting is the, the game Among Us, which has exploded in popularity and, and uh, it seems to, be, seems to be reducing now, but it's a game that uh, is similar to uh, like Assassin or Liar's Dice, but um, somewhat more optimized to have actual the reality of what happened. People watch each other doing things and uh, two of them are, uh, so there's, there's 10 people, eight of them are working toward a particular goal and two of them are trying to sabotage the goal and they, they have chat sessions within the game. Part of the game is talking about who the saboteurs are, who the, the imposters are. Uh, so it's an interesting game because it, it incentivizes lying. It's sort of, I think of it as moral play um, just like Liar's Dice is a really fun game. This is like a, the crack version of Liar's Dice. Um, watching people lie is really interesting. I think kids are absolutely right to be into this game. I think it's great that this is the meta because it says people are really interested in rich social information. Um, I think it's, it's kind of a play version of, of the drama scenes that are maybe more serious drama scenes, like common, commonly people making accusations. Often, often it's morality stuff. Um, identifying the different the different sins. I think this is more of a, a play version of that, that the, the actual drama scene on YouTube can be pretty pretty serious. Um, it's less, less play, it's still play, but it's less play maybe. Um, one thing I'm really interested in is, I don't know how to, I don't know the word for this, complicated fandoms is how I put it, anti-fandoms. Um, kind of like how the, you know, a streamer or a particular YouTuber can be the center of a community. There are these, these communities where a particular person uh, is the center of focus of a community, but not necessarily for good reasons. So they're they're sort of surveilled. They do self surveillance often. They post a lot of a lot of their lives to the internet, uh, but they they kind of attract people who are who enjoy either trolling them or collecting information about them, doing history about them. Uh, and there are there are multiple scenes around around all these people. Even even a single one of these people would could potentially have multiple scenes around them, uh, and they're interacting in different ways. I just think I think that's interesting. Um, often it's that there's so many of them. It's like you can when you first start to look into it, it seems like oh this is just this phenomenon, but then it just gets weirder. It's it's hard to say why. I think again people like rich social information and they're they're getting it from that but i i just think it's it's complex it's interesting i would uh if if i were if i were an official social scientist i'd be studying that probably um and i, I kind of study it in my own my own hobbyistic way uh one scene i really enjoy is youtube crafts um you you see people doing woodworking you know working with a lathe uh or or hand tools um you see people casting ground insect nests and molten metals, like casting wasp nests, pulling it out of the ground to make a, a reverse image of it. Felting, journaling. You see people literally videos of how to make a journal entry. It's amazing. Um, I like the Kawami Japan, I think is his name. He makes knives from everything in the world, makes knives from seashells and crabs and um, 
wood, <laughs> almost eggs. Um, making realistic scale models is, is a common one. Uh, drawing and animation there. I've seen videos of people editing videos. So it's like, here's my craft. And what I'm making is a video and I'm making a video <laughs> of making a craft. I just love it. Um, I've been, and I, this is, is kind of caused me to think a little differently about my own kind of ultra specialized behavioral whole. Cause I find myself um, doing this craft that basically doesn't have a name that almost nobody does. And it seems odd to me, but in this model, that's to be expected that the more you do something, the more, uh, the more specialized you would get to the point where it almost doesn't have a name anymore. It's, it's not the same thing. Um, and what I do is uh, process wool, dye it, uh, mix different colors and spin it and then knit it into um, kind of, I guess mostly mostly shawls, but I don't know that there's really, I guess you could say it's, it's shawl making, but there, I, there's nobody who does exactly what I do that I'm aware of. And mostly, mostly my scene is just, you know, posting pictures to Twitter or something. So <laughs> there's not, I'm not part of like a fiber art scene necessarily. Um, but the, I think we should expect people to have, to have weirder hobbies and that people are probably weirder than we think. Um, I, I often find myself surprised when I dip into the, um, the, the well of, of this sort of scenes, these random scenes that people want to show me. Um, that there, you, you kind of have an opinion going in and then it's just so, it's so much weirder than whatever you thought. So everything's kind of fractally like that. I think that's my last one. So let me stop sharing my screen. All right. Is my screen unshared? It is. Okay, good. Um, ready to favor this on Q and A? Yeah, we can talk about stuff. If anybody has any cool hobby, I would just love to hear about it too. <laughs> cool. So um, yeah, put your question in the chat. Uh, if you'd like to share your hobby or anything, uh, just kind of like just indicate that and I'll, I'll call you to mute yourself. Um, I'm curious, like one thing I like to track is like intellectual scenes, you know, on, on, the, on the internet. One, and one of them that you're kind of pattern matching to is like the post-rationalist living farm mm -hmm. type stuff. Um, do you have any general thoughts on that? Like how uh, the, the active intellectual scenes out there, what's your thoughts on them and maybe the one that you're currently in or, or pattern matches as being in? Yeah, and and uh, um, I just am not the contributing editor of Ribbon Farm anymore for, I haven't been for a couple of years. I'm still so cool with Venkat, we're still friends. I just don't do not do that, that side of things anymore. But um, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know what is my scene. It's kind of like it's hard to it's hard to see it when you're in it. Other people probably know more about it than I do. Um, yeah, I guess there's there's the question like why write more blog posts? Like there's plenty of blog posts. <laughs> like it's inefficient to produce more blog posts. But I think people like writing blog posts and, and people like reading them to some extent. And I think I think it's really cool that publishing is so easy. And um, there's, there's of course a curation issue that if you wanna if you wanna get good things that's that's a constant issue. We thought the internet might solve it, just kind of gave us more stuff and, um, but um, having kind of a scene with some boundaries gives you like I don't know at least at least you're all talking about the same things even if they're silly like. I don't know, today on Twitter, we were all talking about a stunt where somebody was buying people's souls for $10. And, um, I don't know, I feel, I feel like that connects us as much as, as, much as a, a serious you know, 30,000 word blog post or something like that. Cool. Um, Alex, uh, you had a question. And maybe if you uh, um, ask a question, you can share what your hobby is uh, and we can do it that way. Hello, uh, uh, different hobbies. One of them I've been learning about photography and video editing, uh, which actually connects because my question is kind of about uh, work and how work and hobbies, like what makes it that they're distinct? Like there's some way that I am like, oh, if I'm doing something for intrinsic uh, enjoyment, then if I could also make money doing that, that would be great. But then I noticed in some of the 
um, uh, academic things that you're sharing at the beginning, it seemed like there is a way of wanting to put everything into the box of uh, efficiency and like utilization. And maybe that's a part of it. I'm kind of thinking out loud, but I'm curious, like what, like, is it possible for a workplace to have the feel of being motivated by intrinsic motivation? Something like that. I think it's it's a great question. Like you want to, it seems like an impression I get. I don't know how real this is. Is that a lot of people have sort of a dream of of having their hobby be their profession, um, and maybe people kind of realize it wouldn't maybe be as fun if they did, but or that somehow doing their hobby isn't as legitimate as if they were a professional or whatever. Um, and as for work, yeah, like I don't think many people disagree that hobbies are more fun than work, although. There's a lot of there's a lot of mixing there's a lot of mixing between those like what am I distinguishing work and leisure is really hard. Um, I find the economics literature on this fascinating because it's so hard because everybody has sort of a different definition. One definition that I like is that uh, that I don't think is right but that I enjoy is that work is that for which we will accept technological time shortening solutions, whereas for leisure, you wouldn't, but I, I don't think it's true because, so you'd use a washing machine to wash your clothes faster, but you wouldn't use a technological substitute like to play your game faster. I don't know, to, well, that doesn't make sense with speed running, but uh, to watch TV faster or something, or, you know, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't use a knitting machine to knit my stuff. Um, but I think people do that all the time. They use, everything is part work and part leisure. There's no clear boundary between it. Um, I think that there's there's one thing about management that I think is really interesting. I, um, I was playing a game actually at a ribbon farm conference and uh, the leader of the game just was really good at um, bringing everybody's effort into making the game better. And I feel like that must be what it's like to be managed really well. <laughs> that there's such a thing as great management where it feels like they're just pulling everybody's desire, like even their desire to show off, which is very healthy um, and using that for the benefit of the group. like. I think there's, everybody's probably been in some situation where it really felt like, you know, the, it, there's this positive feeling from contributing to the group. Um, I think that's possible. I don't think that's very common, but um, that's, it's something to shoot for. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, Evan, you had a question. Yeah, let me scroll up and find it real quick. Um, <clears throat> So this is regarding scenes. Um, one thing that I'm kind of curious about is the dynamics of scenes becoming seemingly all at the same time, more global, more mm -hmm. interconnected, more professionalized and more mm -hmm. political. And I see mm -hmm. all of these as be, having been driven to some degree uh, by increased interconnectivity of social media. And I'm honestly not sure I'm a fan of this dynamic. So I'm mm -hmm. curious about your thoughts on this sort of evolution of what we might consider scenes. So if you look at the eighties or nineties, um, versus today there, there's a lot in there so wherever you want to take that just something in that direction seems an interesting topic there's there's something my husband and i call a tiling structure which is like it's probably a stupid word for it but it is something that tries to make everything self-similar like to tile the world with itself and those i think are a huge threat to the awesomeness and magic of hobbies and private activity that trying to make everything the same even if it's a good the same that should we should be leery of that like even if it's like trying to um, promote some particular value that seems good. If it's if it's trying to do that universally, it's probably it's probably decreasing our magical diversity. <laughs> so something like making you know making every hobby necessarily political. I got really annoyed. So Ravelry is a, a knitting website, and they got super political a couple of years ago. They decided that um, you can knit hats for one side of the of the politics, but not for the other side of the politics. <laughs> so. Um, I just don't think it belongs there. And their, their official rule was we don't want politics and knitting, but the actual rule was we're picking a side. <laughs> just don't do that. Like, I just want to knit. Um, but yeah, I think that's, I think that's harmful. I think that's a bad, that's bad that everybody, part of the point of hobbies is people from different political realms can come together and just be bros. <laughs> and it's, if you can't just be knitting bros, it's kind of sad. <laughs> Quick follow up. Um, yeah. So like, I guess one thing, one interesting direction to go there is like, I find myself selecting hobbies and scenes now at this point, because I have way too many things I'm interested in doing. They're all fun. How do I choose? Well, at this point, basically the ones that contain political diversity. Like, so, you know, 
I, I wonder if you've seen that with other people or just what your thoughts are there as far as like specifically looking for um, being apolitical or politically diverse in a scene as something that people use to select among the possible hobbies that call to them or whatever, um, because that's definitely something I've noticed in my own life, you know, like I, I enjoy, um, you know, say like the sort of homesteading, permaculture, hunting kind of side of things, because you see a ton of crazy ass liberal hippies and a ton of really conservative people all doing the same stuff. And it's one of the few places I've actually still seen that being the case. I think it would be information to me if I saw a group and it had people from really different political persuasions in it, I would think, wow, these people really care about what they're doing, that they're, they're probably really interested in whatever the subject is or their, their hobby. So yeah, that, that I would at least interpret that as good information. All right, uh, Rachel Haywire, Mota Ewan. Hi. So I'm sure you're aware of this, Sarah. In a lot of scenes, people, they signal frivolity. It's like frivolity all the way down. And it can be funny or it can be like not funny if you're autistic and you think they're making fun of you. Um, or you can just like join in and learn how to be normal by like making silly jokes to like fit in with the bin group or whatever. You, we've been over all of this. But my question is signaling frivolity as a strategy to attain wealth am i the only one who notices this because i see it happen all the time people will you give an example certain, um yes so people will be having a serious discussion and then somebody will come in and make a joke about some french fries and some fart and then they'll be like hey come with me you know and like suddenly they're, they're getting like a two-year contract a secret startup funded by billionaires like i've seen this stuff all the time um and it's very puzzling to me um, another example would be I was at a yacht party, um, ephemeral actually, and there was uh, the, the richest people at ephemeral had like the most frivolous discussions. And then as I went to like the less wealthy parts of ephemeral, the discussions were like a little more serious and career based. So um, yeah, if you could speak about the connection between frivolity and wealth, I mean, am I just making connections in my mind or is this real? I think that's a really good observation um, that uh, to some degree, Frivolity is overlaps a lot with freedom, <laughs> but, um, to the extent that yeah, if you're if you're maybe feel low status or feel like you're resource constrained, probably you have less freedom to do frivolity. And I think it can be it can be a wealth signaling thing that um, uh, yeah, I don't think it always is. I think there's plenty of of frivolous poor trolls, but. Um, uh, yeah, and that that as our society gets richer, we have more more opportunity for volatility. We shouldn't see that as a negative necessarily. That, um, but I also think some of these academics are, seem to be kind of looking at uh, ancient cultures and saying, "Oh, they were they're so sad. They just you know they were forced to do these things." And it's like, why would you think that since we enjoy like dying with indigo, that people six thousand years ago didn't enjoy it? Like, <laughs> it seems like. There, frivolity, I don't think it was just invented. Like, I think it's pretty, pretty human universal that there's some, some under, some core of that, that um, very few societies are so poor they can't afford any frivolity. Um, and that, but that it's, it's a, it, it, it's not only maybe a signal of wealth, that it, to some degree it is wealth, like, um, not just, not just investing in, uh, you know, in space exploration, but investing in just, stuff that people do that might be interesting. Like that's huge for societal wealth to me. Like that's to me what matters is humans experience and that sort of that sort of black void that we don't know much about, but it's just people um, being immersed in things, being interested in things, um, feeling supported and happy. I don't know <laughs> having, and I, another thing is I don't, there's, there's this idea of enjoyment that hobbies are to have fun. And that's, it seems like kind of reductive because they're not always fun. <laughs> like they're often really annoying and they make you mad. And um, so it's, it's almost, it's either tautological or meaningless, but um, I don't think it's just for the positive emotions either. Like it, it sort of has its own value that you can feel while you're doing it. And it doesn't need a justification outside of that. So if I was to go to a party of like semi wealthy people and they begun having a serious discussion on space exploration and I pulled out like a pair of funky socks, would they give me money? Like is there it's like worth, a, it's worth a try. Okay. <laughs> the high, high risk strat, but potentially high payoff. I don't know. 
It just seems like they, they appreciate the audacity of it because it's like so they're so sick of being pitched to and like mm -hmm. talking about serious ideas all the time that all they want is for somebody to like pull out a weird pair of socks and that like gets you on the, the ship. I, I think I, it would like, it would work better if you genuinely don't care. I think that's, <laughs> but that's yeah, hard to, that's hard to fake. Is. Yeah. There it is. So the book the book of the courtier. You, you got to mm -hmm. learn how to not care. I, I wish I didn't care about not caring, but thank you, Sarah. Indeed. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Kuyun, you just put a question in the chat. If you can unmute yourself. Uh, yeah. Hi, Sarah. Uh, Hi. This is Kuyun calling from Vietnam. I'm very interested in your lens on work as something you accept for technological time shortening. Um, and like you said, it's mostly uh, it's, it's useful. So I'm just wondering how you would extrapolate that about the future of work and the future of leisure. Time in, shortening? Uh, and what I'm thinking, yeah. Like making uh, time, see, yep. making time feel shorter or? Uh, yeah, because it seems like uh, I'm just uh, extrapolating myself too, is um, there would be an even bigger split between time shortening part of our life and then like time expanding part of our life. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I see. So like if you're at work, time sort of takes forever. But if you're immersed in your hobby, it kind of goes by like nothing. Is that is that yeah, what you mean? Or do yeah. you mean? Yeah. 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 That's what I mean. And I'm just wondering, like, OK, what do you see as the, how that trend will continue to extend or not into the future? I'm just, you know, like being mm -hmm. opportunistic here. Like, OK, yeah. well, is there opportunity here? Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm so, uh, I have very few predictions about the future. Um, it does, it does seem like it could be that, that you almost don't experience the, the pleasurable times. And it's just, so it just feels like nothing but work. Um, I don't know. It's, um, I feel like there's always one of the things about experience for me is there's always more time. Like as long as you're alive, there's always more time to get through. And oh. um, so, so it's always like, what's, what's the time in front of me? And sometimes it's like, what's the hour in front of me if you're really depressed or sometimes it's like, you know, what's the month in front of me. But um, yeah, I don't know. It seems like there, there's two, there's two problems. Maybe there's the time that you're at work and how to get through that. And there's the time that you're, at play that's still a problem of time disposal but uh, some people call it cognitive surplus that you have excess uh -huh. excess uh, need for cognition and there is interesting stuff around but i don't know yeah, I, don't, uh, I don't really have a prediction <laughs> yeah thank you what well, you said something very uh, helpful is that you said that you feel that there's always more time and mm -hmm. i find that striking i imagine some people here also find that striking yeah, I have, so, a, I have a, a weird time yeah. experience, yeah. So <laughs> it's just out of experiential curiosity, uh, how did you develop that time abundance? Uh, yeah. Oh, de clinical depression. <laughs> okay. That's uh... <laughs> also, also a major, a sleep disorder. That's no, it's just the feeling, the feeling of time as a problem that's weighing on you in the future, I think is the, what's usually called depression. I don't, I don't think the diagnostic category of depression is very useful, but that's that's the word we used for it. So that's that's what it is. I think that's that's part of the uh, the experience of depressed time is there's this yawning chasm of time in front of you, and it's your it's your kind of goal to get through it, or it's your your mission to get to get through it. And yeah, I don't I don't think that's a super common experience of time, and I, I wouldn't have really noticed it was weird without expressing it and talking to other people. <laughs> Well, it will be cool to 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 live like that. I just out of curiosity. One last question. Um, you said that uh, you know frivolity might be an expression of freedom, and um, I'm. I, I think Rachel's comment previously made me think about, and I wanted to hear your thought on this. Is whether or how would it look like if um, we can choose introducing more frivolity as a form of work, meaning like, okay, I want to do this kind of work that will introduce more frivolity into people's life. Um, yeah. I like it, you should do it. 
okay. <laughs> I like I like that as a as a um I don't I don't have it instantly have any ideas, but I like that as a uh just sort of a thought experiment. Like what what could you do that would increase frivolity in the world? I like that. Oh 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 you know, I'm 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 quite practical actually because the way I, I'm setting up my life right now is most people see me as introducing games for people to play. And uh, while I have not been taken quote unquote seriously in the professional sense of the word, uh, it creates a huge impact in people's life. Just like mm -hmm. people know me as someone who just introduced games. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm like, so for people, what I'm doing is leisure, but for me it's, it's work, but work in the, in the good sense of it. And I'm just, mm -hmm. that's why I'm interested in playing with the idea. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do you have time for one more question, Sarah? I would love one more question. All right. Uh, Reed. You're on mute, Reed. Thank you. Um, so someone mentioned in the chat the distinction that you just drew between intentional time shortening being a good distinguishing marker for work and leisure. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that does make a lot of sense. And then I was like, how can I, how can I like criticize that? How can I find like circumstances in which that isn't true and immediately I thought of like um like cooking apparatuses like people that love cooking as a hobby like there's a lot of cooking utensils that actually shorten the amount of time that it takes mm -hmm. uh archery I thought of like compound bows that actually like take a lot of the guesswork out of the art of archery and I guess I was wondering like um in those examples it seems to me like what the cooking apparatuses uh allow the chef to do is to maybe stay in the state better mm -hmm. or something like that sorry this is ceasing to take mm -hmm. the form of a question but uh maybe yeah from with that yeah that kind of goes with the um with the hedonizing technologies idea that uh and, and some people go high tech some people go low tech but that it's optimized not for production it's some it's some efficiency but it's optimized for the experience of and yeah i could see like staying in the state not having to I can't think of it. Cooking is so like unconscious for me. I can't think of any of the tools specifically that I use with their names, but yeah, that it would be a huge pain to have to not have this tool. I don't know, to, um, to, uh, I don't know. I can't, I can't think of any good examples, but, but yeah, I think people, even within leisure, not every part of your fun activity is fun. Like, yeah, you, you don't necessarily, uh, I don't know, like for instance, I, dr I often drive to my hiking spot. <laughs> so I think that's, that's uh, I don't necessarily wanna hike all the way there. I just wanna go there and then hike in beautiful nature. So yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a great definition but I think it's, it is a pretty hard distinction to make because they all are kind of mixed together. Like um, not, that it's not that they're useless abstract nouns, they're useful for communicating things but they're really hard to pin down to a particular meaning. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of seeking a uh, a clear cut because I feel like I need more leisure in my life. So I'm looking for mm -hmm. like, oh, here's like a cookie cutter. This is leisure. Then I can be like, oh, now I can go do more of that. That would mm -hmm. simplify things. But yeah, it seems like there is some some overlap. Cool. Thanks, Reed. Um, so uh, we're past the top of the hour. Any any kind of closing thoughts or anything you want to end with, Sarah? Um, do you want to see the shawl I'm working on? Yes. It's still on the needles. It's kind of, it's sort of a landscape. You can see it's upside down, but here's the kind of the clouds mm. and yeah, it's sort of, it's, it's, uh, one of the issues with shawls is you can't make them too photorealistic or it looks uncanny. So I just went with that and I'm trying to make the most uncanny photorealistic landscape shawl I can, I can possibly do. So, mm. I don't know. I'm curious, do you have like a kind of a sacred space where you do your hobbies? Like if you wake up in the morning and you do it, you have a dedicated time towards it. Like what are the conditions you set up to engender the leisure uh, to emerge so you can do the activity? Um, I don't have, I have non-24 sleep disorder. So, <laughs> so I don't sleep or wake at regular times, but um, so I wouldn't call it, it's just my living room. Um, listening to YouTube videos and spinning or knitting or washing or dyeing or mixing or something. <laughs> Um, 
And it's just, I don't do it every single day. So the sort of, you have to do it every day. It just, when I get called into a project, then I work on it all the time. And then I get, I finish it. And then I wait until I get called into another project. <laughs> it doesn't feel like I'm coming up with the idea for it. It feels like it's something that's out there that's dragging me into it. And that's, that's cool. Like, I think that's, it's neat that things can do that to us. Right, right. Yeah, it's kind of like what you said earlier with the hobby finding us in a way. Mm -hmm. Cool. So uh, we're going to close out here. Um, Sarah is actually coming back, I think, next week to the STOA uh, in a Dialogos with Daniel Gertz, John Raviki, and Lawrence Curry-Clark. Have you ever played the glass beat game, Sarah? At the, that, are you, are you I don't know which, which instantiation. <laughs> I know I'm aware of the novel. I'm not aware of which, which instantiation you mean. Yeah, there's this crazy guy called, the, uh, in, in the best way, Lawrence Curry-Clark. He met something called awesome. the glass beat game. It's like a mm -hmm. conversational game. And uh, he's going to be on the panel. He wants to play it after. Awesome. So, um, if you're down. That for sounds it. great. Yeah. Yes, I'm definitely down. Cool. Thank you so, so much. That was really fun. I thank you for having me as part of your scene. This is really fun. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's an honor and a pleasure. Um, so, at Stoa.ca for more events. Uh, we're doing lots of cool stuff here. We have a wisdom gym you can check out. And uh, yeah, Sarah, everyone, thanks for coming to the Stoa today. Thank you. See you later. <laughs>